Good afternoon. Welcome to the Central Catholic Alumni Speaker Series. My name is Brandon Haberjack, Director of Alumni Engagement and Giving. And today, I'm here with Bill Garrison, Class of 1981, and Steve Shulo, Class of 1989, from live from the McGonagall Theater here at, at Central Catholic to talk about the That Was Paul podcast. Bill, Steve, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for yes. having us. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. Thank you for uh, thank you and Central Catholic for allowing Stevie and I back in the building. Oh, well, well, hold on, speak for uh, yourself to do this. on that one, Bill. <laughs> uh, but no, this is this is a real tribute, and really appreciate you asking uh, us to talk about Paul on this solemn day that uh, we live with every day in our family. But it's also a day that we celebrate Paul's life, and I think this podcast is part of that. Again, we thank you for, for being here with us to, to share Paul's story. And our discussion today is going to be broken up into two parts. Uh, the first part, we're going to take some time getting to know Paul as the person. And then for the second half of our conversation, uh, we're going to focus a little bit more on Paul, the police officer. So to kick things off, I think it's very helpful uh, to learn a little bit about Paul's family and, and where everything started. So Bill, if you wouldn't mind taking us through the, the family, because I know it has a lot to do with who Paul was uh, and who he you know, became ultimately in life. I think, if we, I think a good way to start would be to play this uh, clip of Aunt Susie and Uncle Max, and then we can talk about after just how this uh, sparked uh, the podcast and a lot of stories. So if we could play clip A. My beautiful wife in 1966, and we've been happily married ever since. We've been married 53 years, and I tell everybody that when I die, if God says you can go back as somebody, I'm coming back as Max, and I'm marrying me, because what a life he has had. And, so, and now he's been retired, what, 26 years? And he's still alive, so that gives, that gives me a lot of credit for my patience. So... Um, that's about all. We've been married that long. We had these three kids, and um, Paul was our youngest and our only boy, and he was the love of our lives. And that's about all I have to say. I adore my daughters, but that kid, we adored him. They adored him, too. So in the <clears throat> days, weeks, months, and years since... April 4th, 2009, Stevie knows this all too well. All the stories that came out about Paul. And my Aunt Susie and Uncle Max would, would tell people these stories. And they would, there would be new ones almost every day. Uh, classmates, friends, teammates, but also total strangers. And I think the more... I would go over to visit them, and I'd sit with them for an hour or two or three, and they would just tell all these stories. And they were just telling them almost as if they, they, they had heard them for the first time. And I listened, and stories like this uh, that you just heard, and I thought, uh, we can't not record these. And I didn't know uh, that it was going to be a podcast but the more that these stories came out and the more we, that, that they told them, it was we have to sort of put this together so other people can hear what, how Paul made a difference in his life and other people's lives. And it was because of Aunt Susie and Uncle Max. Sure. Uh, they, uh, Paul, you know, we'll talk a little bit later about one particular story that really <clears throat> made me want to do this. Uh, more than ever. But Paul loved Bloomfield. Paul loved being at home. He wanted to protect Bloomfield and the people there. And he loved Pittsburgh, and he came back uh, to live here. And I think Aunt Susie and Uncle Max are why this podcast is incredible. Not because of anything I did, but because of what they did. And you know how uh, just uh, the type of people they were. Absolutely. And... Uh... You know, in terms of the name that was Paul Podcast, I think it really comes through that, you know, all of these stories were always ended with 
that phrase. That was Paul, right? So um, if you do get a chance, and I, and I highly recommend that you, that you go through it and take the time to listen to it, um, you really get a sense for how good of people uh, Aunt Susie and Uncle Max were and you know, how they raised Paul. So you know, in terms of Paul's upbringing and sort of who he was at a per, as a person and who he, he would ultimately become, you know, what, what did you know, Aunt Susie and Uncle Max, you know, how did they sort of shape him and mold him into that, that person that, that he was? You want me to say that? <laughs> this is yours. Well, I mean, they're, our families, uh, we had a, a very large family, cousins, and um, our families were a lot of, the, we were together constantly. And they were teaching all of us, but Paul obviously too, the values and how to treat people, how to interact with people, adults, um, kids your own age, et cetera. And, you know, those things, that was part of the upbringing back then. And so my aunt and uncle did a great job of that. They obviously influenced, you know, other people in our family too, um, along with our parents, but it definitely um, shaped Paul. So, yeah, and, I, and, and Bill, you mentioned this in the podcast, and I, I think it really sort of hits home for me with uh, you know meeting Aunt Susie and, and Uncle Max yesterday. Um, is you know that, that idea to get to know Paul, you really have to to know Aunt Susie and Uncle Max because he's so much a, you know a, a part of them. Um, so it was truly an honor for me. It was a very special moment to get to meet them. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, you transitioning to sort of Paul's early years, Steve. I know you got a chance to spend a lot of time with him growing up. Um, so can you can you walk us through that? Who was Steve? You know, the kid that running around Bloomfield and you know tearing up the town. And, and who, who was he here? You know, as, as a student at Central Catholic. Yeah. So um, definitely spent more time with Paul than anyone on this planet, you know, so I had, I experienced him in so many ways, um, but yeah, definitely his first thing that comes to mind is his athleticism. Obviously, everybody knows about that just from these stories, but I saw it start um, in Little League Baseball all the way it would start there, and then you started playing hockey, but it, it didn't even get to the central Catholic part yet, the kid just he was he was really good at what he you know, tried to do but he also worked hard to get to be even better than he was so he didn't just come out and you know shoot a 68 in golf but he worked at it and took lessons so things of that nature paul was a he was driven so to to be better at these um sports that he played and he was he was he was good and that took it all the way to, to the central days yeah no doubt about it um you know, Paul had some incredible success, not only as a student, but a student athlete here, uh, you know, at, at Central Catholic. And, um, you know, I believe we have a clip that we might want to play. Um, can we play the uh, clip C, Paul making Central Catholic's hockey team? The time he made, he made uh, Central's hockey, t uh, yeah, hockey team as a freshman. Paul was real little then. And he came home and he told, uh, he told his mother, he said, hey, mine, he said, I made varsity, I made the varsity hockey team. And I said to him, oh, no, Paul, you have to go and tell them you're too little to play. He, he just looked at me, his mouth dropped. He said, what do you mean? I said, because you're going to get hurt. Go over there and tell them that you're too little to play on the varsity. He said, I'll wait till my daddy comes home. I was just going to say, I'm sure my mom told you about how he uh, got on varsity hockey when he was a freshman and she said, no, you have to go back there and tell them you're not doing that. And he goes, I'm not going to do that. 89 so. pounds. She said, well, well, when your father comes home, he's going to be told this and you have to ask him. So when my dad came home, Paul said, dad, can I, I made the varsity team and I'm a freshman. And he goes, that's wonderful. He said, but mommy said, I can't do it. He said, no, you're doing it. So. He, he did and it, and he captain. was successful at it. Very so. successful. Yeah. But all these hockey players that were real big, and there comes Paul, the littlest one on the thing. And he ended up being the captain. Just incredible, and I think that, that quote really speaks to, uh, you know, Paul's determination that you mentioned. For those of you out there, everybody here knows that it's incredibly difficult to make a varsity team, no matter what team, whether that be football, hockey, golf, you name it, 
to make that team as a freshman it really just speaks to the hard work and the, the hours that he put in. And, um, you know, I, I think that really carried out even beyond Central through life. Um, but before we kind of move on with that, I, uh, before I came over here today, I was taking a look at Paul's senior yearbook. And the uh, uh, first time his senior quote really uh, stood out to me, and I, I shared this with uh, Steve earlier, his senior quote was, the first time I looked at it, I saw Jesus saves. And, and um, I said, okay. And then I took a second look at it and looked at the second part of the quote, but the full quote is, Jesus saves, but I score on the rebound. So I just got a, an incredible chuckle out of that. And um, you know, just speaking with you, Bill and, and Steve, um, you, know, you really got a sense that you know, from that quote, that's who Paul was as a person. So I don't know, Steve, right. if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I mean, for sure. That, I mean, I didn't know the exact quote, but when you said it this morning, it's just it, it's the same thing. That, that's exactly who he was right there. You know, um, but he was determined at sports, worked hard at it. He was great at hockey, great at golf. And I'll be honest, Paul was just great at life. So, And I think that <clears throat> the funny part about that quote, too, is that that was Paul's way of just saying, I'm not going to be the one up front, but I'll come around and I'll make a difference this way. And Paul was humble. A lot of the stories in the podcast that my Aunt Susie and Uncle Max would uh, say, they came out after um, his death, was people saying what Paul accomplished, like at Duquesne, uh, what he did on the police force, just what he did as a person. And Paul never, Paul went home to eat dinner and lived in Bloomfield, but always had dinner at his parents' house. And when they went over there, they would just joke around and talk. Paul wouldn't come home and say, this is what I did uh, this week. But when you hear what he did, from like winning a golf t uh, tournament at St. Bonaventure, it was like, he never, I think he came home and said, I won the tournament. And his mom said, okay, go get ready. Uh, we have a wedding to go to. Yeah. And it was like, Paul just didn't care too much about talking what he talking about what he did. He just acted the right way. Yeah, and it was just the the true sense you get of him of, of a leader, right? You yeah. know, he he worked hard and, yeah. and didn't want the attention, but you know, naturally, I think people would have gravitated towards him because you know because of that, and uh, you know, just truly, truly incredible. And that kind of carried out and continued not only here at, at Central Catholic, but even beyond that, eventually going to, to college at Duquesne University and studying psychology, playing golf there in club hockey. Um, can we talk a little bit about sort of that aspect of life? Because it wasn't a clear, you know, linear path to becoming a police officer. He had a, you know, a completely different sort of life prior to all of that. So why don't we talk a little bit about you know, this, this career path that he, and this trajectory that he was sort of headed towards in corporate America and, and sort of how that plays into you know, to, to his early years and shaping who he would become as well. Yeah, I mean, he was majoring in psychology, as you said, or he did, mm -hmm. um, and he got that degree. But I think from there, I don't, I don't know if there was many job opportunities in, the, in that arena, right? But he had a, uh, learned how to, um, for, from a programming aspect, from an IT aspect. So he, he ended up getting a, a job with, uh, I think the first one was Mellon, but I'm not 100% sure, but it was a programming job. So he had a nice um, job getting paid well. But um, I think he did that for a while, but I don't think it was uh, enough, uh, the corporate uh, world wasn't what he wanted in the end, so right. that's what kind of led it down to the uh, the path of becoming a policeman. So. Right. I, I think he went. Then he went to Bayer Corporation, and he tried. Like he he knew, um, and companies. He went. Uh, Kellogg uh, sent him to Michigan and trained him. And and his mom would say, "You can be anything you want." And. Uh, Paul said, you can 
you can pick me up out of this job and replace me with somebody else. But that wasn't fulfilling for him. He could do it just like he could do really well in sports. He was doing really well in his job, but it just didn't make a difference for him. And that, that decision-making process uh, that he went through, and I'm sure it was really difficult because he had a great job, he had a house, and he told his mom and dad, listen, this is what I want to do. Uh, this is going to give me the opportunity to do something fulfilling. And that's, that's a lot. Uh, you know, when you think of your own life and you say, look at the decisions, uh, you might not make a drastic decision like that, but that was Paul. Uh, that was his way of just doing something nobody expected, but it was something that meant something to him. Yeah, and, and you know, listening to the podcast and, and you know, hearing, um, you know, sort of the success that he was having early on in life in, in corporate America, you, you know, I think there's a, a, a new appreciation that I have had, you know, not knowing the backstory um, of all of this, uh, you know, with, with Paul shifting gears, right, and, and really finding his true calling in what made him happy uh, in life. So we're going to go to another clip real quick here. Um, can you play clip D for us, please? But I did tell Paul, I said, Paul... Like, you are, have not seen nothing but the good things in life. Because even though, like, there was not a lot of money, that isn't what a good life is. Good life is love, good family, good friends, good community. That is a good life. I said, you have seen nothing but good. Now you are going to see nothing like the worst. You've seen the best of life, now you're going to see the other side, which is the worst of life. And he said, Mom, someone has to do it. And I said, well, I can't argue with you. Like I was looking for a way to argue with them, to try to tell them, you know, this is dangerous. But I, I said, well, I can't argue with you with that, Paul. Someone does have to do it. I always told Paul well, when he became a police officer, Bill, I said, Paul, what you do, son, I said, you put your mother's face on a woman, you put my face on a man, you treat them with the respect you treat us, and you'll never have a problem while you're serving the citizens of Pittsburgh. And that's what he did. I think that, uh, that quote there in that piece is very important to hear because it really gives you perspective of how you know, that, that family aspect that we talked about first um, really sort of infused into Paul and became who he was as a person and then ultimately as a police officer as well. So focusing on that person piece, Steve, I know, I know you spent a lot of time with him, like I said early on. What was your initial reaction when you heard that, you know, Paul say, hey, you know what, I want to become a police officer? Yeah, I think um, a lot of us, his friends, family too obviously um we kind of he had a good good paying job and you know a nice career path potentially and we were kind of um a little taken back maybe but you know i i had pulled paul aside the one day because a couple of our friends said you know why is he leaving that job to do something like this and i pulled him aside and i just said i go is this something this this is what you want right he said, absolutely. I said, well, as his mom and dad did too, I'm behind you 100% then. Um, but another thing, he went to the academy and it was like three weeks into it. And I said, I should check to see if he's, this is still what he wants to do. So I, I called him up and I said that to him. I said, Paul, hey, how do you feel about your decision thus far going through the academy three weeks or whatever, two weeks it was? And he said, Steve, I'll be honest, it was the best decision I ever made. So to me, I was content at that point because he was going down the path he wanted to. So, And, you know, with Paul, you know, joining the police academy, not at the typical age of what an officer right. would join at, mm -hmm. Bill, can, can you, you talk a little bit about it in the podcast, but can, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about sort of the maturity aspect of who he was at that point in his life and, 
and you know really how you know some of the other folks that were in the academy with him sort of gravitated towards him and, and how he was able to influence some of those those guys uh, throughout the process. Oh my goodness, the, the, the stories, <laughs> the stories that Aunt Susie and Uncle Max tell, you have to listen to them. I'm not going to do them justice, but, but Paul was about 30, and that was old, older for the academy. They, his nickname was Pops uh, to the other uh, students. Uh, and Paul, Paul had a level of maturity, and what, uh, what Aunt Susie talks about is he, he had a sense of what was important. He knew that family was important. He had lived long enough to know what, that his community was important, what he wanted to do. And that took, that's different. Uh, the, the younger uh, police officers, I'm sure, felt, a little bit of that too, but you know, they're probably a little more eager and they want to do this job, they want to do it great. Paul had another sense and they gravitated towards him and he would invite eight or nine of them over to his house uh, for spaghetti and he bought them all pizza one time and he, he had Aunt Susie and Uncle Max buy like 15 pizzas and he would just, and these guys were in awe of Paul. This is a guy that like, was on the other side. He, he came in. He, he's joining us. He's inviting us into his house. They all became part of his family. And that, uh, it was just, even though he went in at an older age, that, I think that helped that he was grounded. And he had a lot of life experiences. And he knew... Uh, these things that he valued, and he brought that to that job. Now I have to, uh, I have to get you to tell another story because I know Aunt Susie and Uncle Max are tuning in from home today. Um, so shortly after graduating from the the academy and the dinner that you speak of, uh, Uncle Max got into a little trouble. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh my goodness! This, this, I'll try to condense this, and people who know me out there know. That's impossible for me to do. But um, so all these guys came over for dinner, and they they ate like kings, and they couldn't believe how good the food was because a lot of um, I learned about uh, people that join the academy, men and women, that they're not always from around Pittsburgh. Uh, they might move in and get an apartment um, just to go through the academy. So. Some of these people, uh, some of these guys didn't know the area. They would eat. So here they are feasting in Aunt Susie and Uncle Max's tiny uh, dining room. She said they were all lined up to wash their hands. She made them all wash their hands. And she said it was like kindergarten cop or something. They're all lined up. And so they eat, and they just love it. And so they leave, and they live on a really narrow street in Bloomfield, Pearl Street. There's one line of cars on the right side, barely enough room for one car on the left side. Uncle Max would park on the left side. You know, maybe pull up on, on the curb just for a little bit until a spot opened up, so he goes out. He parks the next day. He goes out, and there's a ticket on his car. And he rushes into Aunt Susie going, do you see I got a ticket on the car? And he looks at the, the, the officer, and it's one of the guys who was having dinner there who ate with them the night before or a few nights before. And he goes, can you believe this? These guys just ate dinner here, and they gave me a ticket. They're not allowed in here <laughs> And Aunt Susie said, Calm down, Uncle Max. Uh, uh, calm down, Max. I'll call Paul. And so Paul was working on the north side or something, and she calls him. <laughs> of course, Paul's expecting a call, right? Uh, your father just got a, a parking ticket, and they're going to they're gonna tow him. And he goes, no, no, 
what, uh, what's going on? And uh, Paul said, well, you're lucky they didn't tell you. And she's like, what are you talking about? And he goes, well, he, he's parked on the wrong side of the street. And she goes, I can't, I'll just pay it. And Paul said, don't pay it. She goes, no, 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 I'm going to pay it. He said, it's just a joke, Mom. And so, <laughs> so he just had this whole practical joke all worked out. And he waited to the very end. And Am I that missing? was Paul. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was weird. And it's the like these stories yeah. were like, okay, that was him just thinking ahead. Yeah. How can I get a little little laugh here? And, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, Paul hung on to that ticket for a while, huh? And used to, yeah. to, to They tell still have it. About yeah, it. Yeah. No, no, they have it. They have it at home, and that's become a thing that they look at. <laughs> that this is what he did, so. So we're going to go ahead and transition uh, to another clip. Can you play Clippy for us? He was here the night before he was killed, and I'll never forget his smile when he was walking up. Like he was walking up, and we always said, we love you, Paul. Yep. And he always said We'd it back. We'd walk him to the door. And he'd give us, you know, give me a kiss and go out. And that smile when he was getting in the car, I said, oh, my goodness. You know, yeah. I'll never forget that smile on his face because he was truly, he found his calling. Now, I think this is a good point, and that's a great quote, the transition between Paul the person and Paul the officer. You know, it, it is you know, very clear that, you know, as we just discussed, that this was his calling. This is something that he wanted to do and he, you know, felt a, a need to do. Um, so, you know, Paul, the police officer, you know, I, when going through the, the podcast, you really get a sense that, and I believe, Bill, I think it might be a quote from you, um, you get the impression that when, when he would leave for a shift every day, always had a smile on his face, always, excite, always excited to get out there, and really his mindset was not who am I going to arrest today, but who am I going to help today? And I know, um, you know, after Paul's death, there were you know countless stories that have that have come out um, about folks that he had helped along the way. Um, so, can we talk a little bit about that and, and maybe share a story or two with us uh, about Paul, the the police officer? Yeah. Well, I'll start, Steve, and then yeah. uh, the thing. There wasn't. I think the beauty of Paul is that there wasn't a whole lot of difference between Paul the person and Paul the police officer. He brought the way he was to that job. And it was a way for him to be able to help uh, people in that job. And the one, I think just one story that really struck me when Aunt Susie and Uncle Max told me, which is probably the one that I said, there's no way I'm not going to record these and try to make something so that this is preserved, was this woman sh showed up about 10 years after Paul was killed, showed up at Aunt Susie and Uncle Max's door with her older daughter, a uh, young teenage daughter. And they had never met this woman. And she said, I just want to come in and tell you a story about Paul. And uh, she sat down and she said, when I, when my daughter was a baby, I was caught shoplifting at a grocery store in Bloomfield. And she was, she had babies, uh, baby food and stuff. Uh, she was really uh, uh, struggling and she said it was a mistake, but she was, uh, she got caught. The manager called the police, Paul, answered the call, uh, came into the supermarket, saw this woman, saw the baby. The manager was irate. I want, I want to press charges. And Paul said, Paul took him. He said, uh, you go over here for a second. Let me go. And he told this woman, just sit over here. Let me take care of this. And he went to the manager. He ended up paying for her groceries. And he told the manager, don't press charges. She won't uh, do this again. She won't come in here again. Uh, just do this for me. 
And he said, okay. He drove her home with her baby. And he gave her his card. And he said, if you ever need anything, you call me. And she's telling this story to Aunt Susie and Uncle Max. And she said, I did call him. And he was always there to help. He gave me some money. He would get me groceries if I needed it. I turned my life around. And I'm here today because of that. Because that, that could have turned on that woman. And Paul recognized it. And that was Paul the person. And he was just doing it as his job. And that's how he impacted people's lives. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that showed his leadership and his ability to relate to people at any, any situation they were in, any level of director of something to someone who's shoplifting, um, treated them, as my aunt and uncle said, as if their face was on that person. So definitely was a big part of that. This is probably good to play uh, F, right? Yeah. Would that be good? Mm -hmm. Because I think it says exactly what you said. This well, is Julia. Well, like he was the person that didn't care where you came from. He didn't care how much money you had. He didn't care if you were liked by many. He didn't care if you were liked by one. He, he liked you because of you. Yeah, I, you know, in listening to the, the podcast, you know, obviously there was a shared central connection, connection between Paul and, and, and the tragedy. And, you know, I, I knew of Paul, you know, as, as a central graduate and as a police officer that was tragically killed. I did not know all of these incredible stories that, you know, that really came out uh, you know, as that spoke to the person that he was. And, you know, if there's one thing that, you know, in speaking with you guys and speaking with um, Aunt Susie and Uncle Max, there's so many more of these types of stories about, you know, how truly great of a person Paul was and, and how not only did, you know, did he impact, you know, those directly, his, his friends and family, but people that, you know, he maybe spent five minutes with or 10 minutes with or 15 minutes with in sort of the lowest moments of their lives. And I think there, there's one other story, Bill, if you wouldn't mind telling uh, about the, the homeless man that was sort of sleeping mm -hmm. in, you know, in between the church and the rectory. Um, and, and, you know, if you wouldn't mind just telling that yeah. real quick. <clears throat> uh, so uh, uh, the pastor at, at uh, St. Joseph's uh, Church in Bloomfield, where uh, Paul uh, grew up and went, uh, went to church there in school, he, uh, there was a man sleeping by the rectory, and they called the police, and Paul came, and he went over to this gentleman, and he, the guy was a veteran, and he, Paul just took him up, and he said, let me drive you home, and he didn't arrest him. He could have taken him in. I think that was, a, that was part of his job, and he could have been done with it, but he, he took this guy home again. He told him, if you ever need anything, and this guy, because he knew Paul could have arrested him, he could have been hit with a lot of fines, and he could have, you know, maybe never bounced back. Years, well, the, the funeral mass, uh, there's this guy sitting in church, and he has a tie on, a suit, and... And Susie and Uncle Max just wanted to know who that was because he was there. And, and they went up and talked to him, and he said, Paul could have arrested me, but he didn't. He said, I stopped drinking. I turned my life around, and I'm here today because of Paul. And that was just, that was just a story that came out at Mass. Wasn't anything he came home and said, uh, look at what I did today. But, but that just shows that small act of kindness, what it could do to somebody. 
Yeah, and it, you know, it, it just truly who he was at a person and, and sort of where I want to go next is, you know, we just spent some time talking about Paul helping complete strangers, but not only was Paul, did Paul influence uh, those folks' lives, but also his fellow, op fellow officers. You spent some time speaking with, um, you know, one of Paul's uh, training instructors and, and, and also some of the folks that sort of got to knew him on the police force. You know, how did this personality, how, how did this sort of mindset that Paul have sort of infuse itself, not only into, like I said, the, the, the folks that were strangers, but also his fellow officers? Oh, there's just, uh, obviously we know uh, Chip Baker, who's a lieutenant with the police force and he, uh, drove around with Paul as his mentor or uh, trainer, whatever he was doing while Paul was in the academy. And Chip just tells great stories about Paul was the, like the mayor of Bloomfield. He knew everybody. He would take Chip into the pizza shops and say, I want you to meet my friends. And he just brought his life, and it wasn't, these were just more of his friends, and he, and the officers just respected it. And there is a, uh, there's a story in the podcast about Lot 17, which is a bar in Bloomfield that Paul would always go to. And an officer, uh, Keith Miles, who, veteran police officer, took the report and. Paul heard that it was about Lot 17. Paul didn't, obviously was not part of that call. And Paul was a rookie, and Keith Miles was a veteran, and he goes, you know what, I didn't really associate with rookies, but Paul waited around after his shift to thank Officer Miles for taking this report. And Keith Miles is like, I do hundreds of these reports. Nobody thanks me. Nobody waits after their shift. He said, Paul cared about these people. And he, he wanted to thank me for doing a good job on taking this report. And we do have a, I think we can maybe uh, play this one now, uh, Keith. Um, H. Can we play clip H, please? Yeah. yeah, so this is Keith. And he's a veteran police officer, but this was the impact uh, that Paul had on him. Paul was down to earth, he was a real person. You know, you could tell, you know, here's this guy, you know, like I said, with a hot minute on the job, who was doing things that maybe an officer with 30 years should have done. It immediately stuck out to me when he did that. You know, here's this kid didn't know me from a can of paint, never seen me before, but made certain that he would stop hold up his day, wait for me to get there, and I got to be truthful with you, I'm usually late. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and just stuck around to make sure that he stuck around and let me know how appreciative he was. Yeah, it, you know, it, again, just going back to that, that, you know, to put this in perspective for you is, is that, you know, Paul was on the job for maybe a year or, or two in, in hearing you know, all of these stories. And, and there was just such a mature aspect in the way that, that he conduct himself and, and just his ability to interact with people and, and speak to people. See, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. Um, can you just, you know, I, I wanna tie this back to Central just real quick, because Paul being a kid from the city, being from Bloomfield, really surrounding himself in, in hockey and golf, which is, you know, he's, probably some folks with it within that that had, you know, from a different lifestyle outside of the city. So how did that play into, you know, Paul's ability to connect with folks and, and then ultimately why he was so successful as a police officer and his ability to communicate with folks? I think, I mean, like Billy said earlier, um, to him just being humble as a person started it there, right? And then obviously the parents and all the influences there, but um, it wasn't like we had, you know, tons of money growing up in, in the city and our family was big, but um, money wasn't, that wasn't what it was about. It was about how he was being raised and how he was treating others. And that started with us, like, from a young age. I mean, the way we had to speak to adults and different things like that and the way you learned your manners. I mean, Paul, um, 
that's where it started then, and it just um, continued with his influence on people. I think he had a calmness and a uh, coolness and a delivery like nobody else, and it just set everybody at ease when they interacted with him, no matter who it was, if you were his family, if you were his friend, or if you were a stranger. So that's the, that's the best way to put it. Uh, you know, uh, Uncle Max mentioned in a quote that we heard earlier, uh, you know, with him going out every day, you know, put my face on a man and your mother's face uh, on a woman. And, you know, if you do that, you'll have no problems. You know, I, obviously I never was on a shift with Paul, but I truly do believe that that's what he did each and every time he got into his police car. Uh, and, you know, in doing that, that was so fulfilling for him, knowing that he was, was helping folks. So shifting gears, I want to kind of turn the conversation to uh, April 4th, 2009. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that day and, and just kind of what it meant to you, what the family was going through at that point, um, and really just kind of transition to how you were able to get through it. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I still recall that morning, um, beautiful day. Um, but... I, my phone was ringing. It was eight, whatever time it was, my phone started ringing. My wife had gone to work that Saturday. My phone kept ringing. I was on the treadmill. I was working out. I had my son, I think Lucas was probably three years old. He's walking around the basement, and this phone just ke keeps ringing. I go over and answer it, and I don't recall exactly who it was, but, um, yeah, there's been a, a shooting like everybody else your heart just sinks and you think you know maybe maybe it's not him maybe it's didn't know all the details yet neither did Aunt Susie and Uncle Max and uh, as time passed that day still didn't know but your gut was telling you that something was wrong so Finally, at some point in the afternoon, we all officially found out, and um, everyone started heading down to my aunt and uncle's house, because where else? We all wanted to be together to embrace them, and I mean, all of us, just because we were so close, that, and we knew what they, their son meant to them, and so we all went down to the house on Pearl Street, there was friends coming down, family, and it was it was just complete shock that we were in this position. And I say we as a family, friends, everybody. So it was uh, it was not. A, I mean, it was just a complete blur. Those days after the it, funeral, and it was just you were. I, you I mean, couldn't was just standing there in you, shock. You couldn't imagine our family was thrust into this. It was very, very public, obviously, with the other two officers, just a amazing outpouring. We were in uh, the funeral procession, just in a sheriff's van, and the, the police force and the sheriffs and the whole city came together. We... They did everything that they could for the family. The, the viewings at the city county building, you can't imagine just the, seeing people lined up along the streets. Uh, for Paul and uh, for Stephen Maley and Eric Kelly, and for us to just go, is this, is this real? This is just such a... And and you're, it's so personal, but you're sharing it with like so many people. Yeah. It was a, and my aunt Susie and Uncle Max were so strong throughout all of this. We all were like, you know, falling apart, but they were, they were strong. They they sort of, and that's part of Paul. They gave that to Paul, and they kept that. The, that strength, and they talked to everybody, hundreds of people in the funeral line outside the funeral home, blocks long. 
And it was just this, uh, it was an outpouring of love and support that you knew because you live in Pittsburgh that you were not alone because you had people, you had family. It, it didn't even have to be your family. There were people, total strangers, really feeling for you and wanting to help. And there was, I mean, go ahead, because I was uh, maybe, uh, the letters that came out and the things that came out after were just amazing. In the support of Pittsburgh mm -hmm. and the support of not only your family, but these complete strangers that, uh, you know, that were showing up at the door who were coming across. I, I, the funeral was at that Peterson Event Center, uh, you know, it, tens, 12,000 people in attendance for that. But the, the strength that you guys found to get through it really came out you know, came out of that support from others. Um, and so just what does that mean to, to, to your family? Um, and, you know, to this day, 13 years later, we're sitting here now, and, you know, how has that continued? We still, yes. yeah. <laughs> still have the emotions, as you saw. Sorry about that. We still have the emotions of 13 years ago, um, but all of the um, outpouring of support, even early on when we had different events, I, I don't know if you remember the motorcycle yeah. ride coming down the street, and their street's like a hollow, and this motorcycle, uh, I don't know what you call it, but it was just a line of motorcycles Caravan, for two miles long. Hundreds of motorcycles. Um, and they came down, and it it just, like, these were just motorcycle guys. I mean, yeah. they were in on this, and yep. just events like that, I think it helped everyone, including his mom and dad, get through things with the support and the outpouring of, like, wow, this is all for, you know, support for these three officers that were in, put in this position and their families. And it was, those events continued, um, but also uh, things like Billy saying, just showing up and talk, uh, cops showing up at my aunt and uncle's house to allow them to talk about them again. I think that's all part of healing so grieving, there's no course of correct action, right? And so I think that has helped them tremendously through that all because different people with different stories, um, not only as a cop, but friends, um, different events that happened. I think it helped, I mean, the scar tissue's there, but it's, it, it's helped us um, come to things like even Billy with your podcast. It's helped us tell these stories and we have only scratched the surface of the stories. Some of them can't be told on the podcast. <laughs> Some of them can, but we've only scratched the surface. Um, but the ones that are out there, um, people who didn't know him, et cetera, like you said earlier, might have um, gotten an idea now from these stories of what he was, yeah. was about. So. And I think that's, that's a great point, Stevie, because people would come to my Aunt Susie and Uncle Max's house, police officers or, or strangers or neighbors, they, they needed to, to heal by telling them what they thought of Paul. And so my, my aunt and uncle, whether they wanted to or not, the, they were helping other people, including myself doing this podcast. This has just been something from the heart, and it's helped me heal a little bit, uh, get to know these stories, obviously, by heart. But they would come and they would say, we just need to talk about Paul. And they'd sit with him hours, feed them probably. <laughs> but that's what they've become. They have been, for what they've gone through, they have been the ones helping others. So, But all the stories have also gotten us to look at Paul and say maybe allow at least me anyway to grow as a person because I'm far from where I need to be and when I start thinking back of the things uh, and hearing those stories from the people that he was dealing with in the police force etc I'm kind of like okay I need to improve a little bit here and I need to get huh, I need to get a little stronger straightened too. out my yeah, life and I can do this you know, step up your game in different ways too to get to a level where he was right so
Yeah, it, you know, um, yesterday, again, had the, the opportunity to, to meet Aunt Susie and Uncle Max, and in my conversation with them, uh, I let them know that I was starting to get a little nervous. And Aunt Susie said, don't worry, honey, Paul will be with you. And, um, you know, it just kind of leads me in, into my next point, because I think that, uh, you know, it's why we're here today. Paul is still with us, and he continues to inspire people with the way that he lived his life. And, you know, obviously with the, with the podcast, you know, you really get a sense for, for that inspiration and, and how that, you know, and how that can impact, um, you know, others, but also here at Central Catholic with, you know, 750 students in the building, we really hope that this, this story and hearing these stories inspire them to become great people and live like That's Paul. So, so, you know, just, you know, in terms of that, you know, how is Paul still with you today? You want to, I'll, I'll go. Um, well, he's he's with me in so many ways. I, I actually um, had a son shortly after that. Um, actually, it was, we found out shortly after he was buried that um, I was having one. So I asked my aunt and uncle, too, if I could name him Paul. And they said, yes, and biggest honor in my life. And so that right there keeps me every day. I have his chain. I have a tattoo on my arm for him. Um, pictures in every room of my house. <laughs> my wife, God bless her, but she's like, you're going to put a picture up in that third bedroom where no one sleeps. I'm like, yeah, it's good. We got another picture. We're going to put it up there. <laughs> Can you put a family and, picture yeah, up, Steve? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, so Paul's around me all the time. Um, the memories that I have of a kid, they're always going to be there. My uncle and I tell stories, my aunt, my uncle and I, we tell stories about Paul and our fishing trips, our trips to the Civic Arena for the Penguin Games when there was no fans there, 1,200 fans pre-Lemieux. Um, I'm aging myself now here. But um, all those times, my uncle and I can recount those um, and relive them. And, it, you know, it, it's just, it doesn't give us what we want, which is one thing, and we all know what that is, but it uh, allows us to think back of all the great memories and great times that we did spend together, so. Yep, and I think uh, you can call Paul anytime now. Uh, he, uh, you know, he's going to be there, and uh, I think these uh, stories really can tell people that if they are struggling with something or they're having a tough time or they have a decision in life or uh, think, think what Paul would do, uh, just try to find some strength in him. Uh, I know, you know, my Aunt Susie and Uncle Max say, as long as we're talking about him, he's here. And so they're not going to stop and we're not going to stop listening. So. One last point. We're the lucky ones to be able to tell this today yeah. and other times. He has many other friends right. um, that were really close with him that maybe haven't had this opportunity. We speak for them in some ways, too, so true. Um, because they would love to come and speak, but you probably would have a line out the door, so we can't do that, obviously. We're probably over the 45 minutes that you allotted for today. I'm just le like giving well, we um, information to those friends out there, too, that um, they have memories that are, you know, um, they hold to their heart, and they would um, love to speak about them. He had a lot of close friends, so. Those just, are the stories you can't tell, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm you're, kidding. You're, you're, I'm you're, kidding. You're, you're, no, again, thank you. Um, I, I know that uh, that last section there was, was a very emotional um, you know, piece to, to talk about. So shifting gears here to sort of uh, the, the final episode of the podcast. Yeah. You know, what should we expect from, from episode five moving forward? Well... Episode five is finished and it's posted. So, uh, you know, if you want to go to Apple Podcast or Spotify or thatwaspaul.org, uh, which is the little website that we have where you can listen to it. Episode five has a lot of stories that came out after uh, the funeral and the outpouring, as we spoke about, uh, letters. 
that my Uncle Max reads uh, uh, central uh, stories about the hockey alumni game with the police force, and they raise money for Paul's uh, scholarship fund, and just more about it just, it'll never be wrapped up, but sort of had to end it somewhere. And there, there were more that I could have put in here, but I think it was just a way to end it in a way that says, this is how we remember him. And just the things that people said about him remind Aunt Susie and Uncle Max that this is, this is what Paul was like. And this is what he meant to others. Do we want to play uh, clip G, please? <laughs> he said, I had the privilege to play hockey with Paul when we were teammates at Central Catholic. Paul led the team as all true leaders should, not by talk, but quietly by his excellent performance on the ice and his impeccable character off the ice. When I heard the tragic news, I didn't have to look at the yearbook and remember Paul's senior quote, Jesus saves, but I score on a rebound. Paul's sense of duty and call to serve his city is, is a tribute to his family. As we enter Holy Week, we pray that you are comforted by knowing that Paul died performing what is the ultimate sacrifice, saving his fellow man, Kevin Ackler. That's a quote that, that you'll hear in episode five right, yeah. from, from fellow Central Catholic alum and, and teammate Kevin Ackland. And uh, you know, I think it um, you know, sums up how, how we all feel. And uh, you know, we're coming to the, the end of, of our session here today. So we want to thank you again, Bill, Steve, and you know, all of the Sholo family for, for allowing us to tell this story and, and spending time with us and, and making us feel such a part of your family. So thank well, you thank again. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you very much. Yes, Central it, meant a lot to Paul, and so this is, uh, this is a real honor, so thank you. Thank you. And I want to conclude the session today um, just with a, a little note here um, that was, was written by Uncle Max that, that I think says uh, a whole lot, and um, we'll, we'll finish with a quote um, you know, before we, we wrap up. And for those that, that are on, at home watching, thank you for joining us and, and tuning in today. We hope you got a chance to learn a little bit more uh, about Paul and, and who he was. And um, so if you didn't get a chance to catch it, it will be on our YouTube channel. And, and, and last but not least, uh, you know, I highly recommend that if you haven't, please do check out the That Was Paul podcast. It's, it's very well done. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. so this says, Paul, it has been 13 years since your life was tragically taken from us. Your life was beautiful. Your death was heartbreaking. But your presence is strong. Your spirit is alive in the lives of those who loved you. Paul, you truly did make a difference. Your loving family and friends. And if we could play quote uh, I. I, please. When Paul joined the police, he would every single day of his life was the happiest person we had ever seen. Paul followed that little voice inside of him. And I think that's what made that's what directed him to become a police officer. He found that true calling that's inside each one of us. Thanks again, guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for those, again, watching at home, we appreciate you joining us. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. St. John Baptist de La Salle, pray for us. Pray for us. Live Jesus in our hearts forever. forever.